I want to thank Kat. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. I'm really happy I was invited back again from a, um, long ago. So it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today, uh, I want to touch on uh, two stories, if I uh, end up having enough time, where I will share with you how we are thinking about using stem cell biology to better understand uh, many different situations in the lung, such as homeostasis and injury repair. Uh, and today, we won't talk about cancer, but certainly it's a major interest in our lab. And the way we like to focus our lab's research is to think about whether or not stem cells might be part of the initial mechanisms in the many different lung diseases that you see listed here. And one of the features that all of these diseases have in common is that there are either a diminution of the epithelial cells that line your airways or the bronchioles, or those within the alveolar space where gas exchange occurs, or in the situation of cancer, these cells are altered and perhaps too numerous. So we'd like to understand, can we get a better handle on the early stages of these diseases, and can we determine, is it a defect in the stem cells in the lung, or perhaps the other cells that talk to those cells? Now in this picture on the right is a lung uh, sample from a person with emphysema, which inc is included in the disease COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. And you can appreciate that there seem to be many fewer alveolar cells, and it's certainly a very complex disease. But I think you can appreciate that we need to understand how to maintain uh, the numbers of these alveolar cells as in this situation. So how do we approach answering these types of questions? Well, first, we have largely used mouse models, and we'll touch on human at the end of the talk. Uh, and within the uh, mouse pulmonary system, there are at least three major niches where epithelial cells reside. And each of these has its own identified uh, residential progenitor cells. So we can think about the trachea, the bronchioles or airways, and the alveolar space as being unique niches for these different epithelial cell types. And of course, these epithelial cells interact intimately with different mesenchyme and immune cells. Now, over the years, uh, we have been more focused on the distal portions of the lung. And within this part of the lung, there are a numerous uh, diverse types of cells that have been described to have progenitor cell function. So if we focus on uh, these blue cells, as you heard about, uh, that we initially identified in my postdoctoral studies long ago, uh, we called these BAS, or bronchial alveolar stem cells, and showed they may have the potential to give rise to airway cells and alveolar cells. But there are many different lung stem cells. The alveolar type 2 cells can self-renew. They can give rise to the alveolar type 1 cell, which is the pneumocyte that actually performs gas exchange. And there are many different subsets of these cell types as well. In the airways, we have the club cell, which can also self-renew and give rise to more specialized cells, such as the ciliate ciliated cells. So this really begs the question of why do we have so many of these different types of epithelial progenitors and how can we study them? So over the years in the lab, we've made use of an organoid model system that was initially developed by a former postdoctoral fellow, Ju Hyung Lee. And we did this by uh, developing methods to uh, prospectively identify epithelial stem cells, such as that Basque population with cell surface markers, and then combine them with lung stromal cells in an air-liquid interface with matrigel to make these three-dimensional organoids. Uh, using this population of cells, we can obtain bronchiolar organoids, such as those seen here, which really give us a window into epithelial cells that line the airways. And we can also derive alveolar organoids, which resemble the alveolar space uh, and which contain cells that have alveolar epithelial features. Now, we've used these organoids and then gone back and forth between the organoid system and mouse models in order to identify factors that by which these epithelial stem cells are regulated, especially in 
the means by which they regulate their differentiation. But now that we've done that, we spent quite a lot of time over the last five years uh, trying to understand um, how we can use these systems to ask some more specific, uh, really broad questions, which are, uh, why do we have these different epithelial stem, stem cells in the lung? What controls their usage? How does this change with age? And of course, how does that relate to disease susceptibility? Now, in the first part of the talk, I'll focus on uh, how we started to think about this, especially in relation to the disease I mentioned, COPD. COPD contains features of both an abrogated airway, such as uh, remodeled airways, as well as a diminished alveolar space. So we wonder, how does it arrive at this dysfunction within the different compartments? And so in order to begin to ask about this, we decided to make use of a very simple system in the mouse, and that is an injury model called naphthalene. So naphthalene is an airway cell type specific injury. You can see on the left a corn oil control mouse uh, in which the club cells here in purple are normal. A naphthalene treated mouse, the club cells have been uh, killed off, but a normal mouse can repair this injury in 7 to 14 days. And so what Irene Wong a really amazing graduate student in the lab, um, decided to do was to use both single cell RNA-seq, which I won't show you in detail, and also in vivo studies. And what she learned was that in response to this airway-specific injury, that the alveolar type 2 cells, the progenitor in the alveolar space, is actually undergoing transient proliferation. Now this is quite surprising because in a control mouse lung, these cell types are typically quiescent. There are no Ki67 positive cells. However, after this naphthalene damage, uh, in a very uh, short time course, they undergo a proliferative wave, which is then quieted down by the time the airway injury uh, is resolved. So this was really interesting to us, and so we wondered, can we model this in the organoids? And so Irene treated mice with naphthalene or control and put them into the organoid co-culture system, which includes normal mesenchyme. And however, she was not able to recapitulate this phenotype. The organoids from naphthalene-treated mice grew similarly to those as corn oil. So, however, because this system relies on a normal, healthy mesenchyme, we wondered if there may be other cell types causing the difference in vivo. So when Irene went back to her single cell RNA sequencing data, she had also sequenced the mesenchymal cells. Now, uh, we won't go into this in great detail, but in the adult and developing lung, there are a a large diversity of different mesenchymal cell types, which you can see here in this uh, UMAP from the single cell RNA-seq. And certain uh, populations have been identified uh, by Ed Morrissey and many other labs that have shown, for example, cell types that regulate the alveolar epithelial cells, or these so-called Manx. And Irene noticed that she could identify the Manx, but that she also found a unique population that was uh, increased in abundance after naphthalene injury and called them the MANC2 cell. Now, I don't have time to go into detail about these cells, but we're really interested in what they're doing. Uh, and they seem to be expanding in this injury condition. But what she did for this part of the talk is that she looked at how this mesenchymal cell is changing its gene expression in response to the airway injury. And when we look at the GO terms associated with those differentially expressed genes, again, the genes expressed differently in the mesenchyme when you injure the airway, many of those genes involved monocyte, or also uh, known as macrophage-related uh, uh, genes. So this made Irene wonder, are perhaps if macrophages are playing a role in our phenotype. So she went back to this naphthalene injury model, and she performed a fax analysis of different blood cell types, along with analyzing the other cell types of interest. And she found that indeed, in the time course of naphthalene airway injury, that there is a, a time period where there's a significant increase in the abundance of the macrophages. 
This then allowed her to return back to our organoid model and ask if the macrophages may be playing a role in the alveolar proliferation. So she took mice that were injured with naphthalene. She uh, obtained the bronchoalveolar lavage, which is a washing of the lungs with fluid, which largely gives you immune cells. She then uh, used beads to enrich for CD45 positive cells, and then she co-cultured those cells with cells from a normal DS red mouse that had not been exposed to any injury. And she used that as a source for our alveolar organoids. And what she saw was very excitingly was that taking uninjured epithelial cells, but using macrophages from the naphthalene treated mice, that they were sufficient to increase the uh, alveolar organoid forming efficiency. And so therefore, providing macrophages to the culture is a mimic of the alveolar proliferation that we saw in vivo. But she didn't stop there. She went on to go back in vivo, and she used uh, the clodronate liposome system to, uh, <clears throat> to reduce macrophage abundance. And uh, in doing so, she could see that mice treated with clodronate did have, no longer have the alveolar epithelial proliferation response to airway injury. And this is true in cells near the airway as well as in the alveolar space. So in summary, what I've shown you so far is that when we perform injury of the airways, we observe an abundance of proliferation of the alveolar type 2 cells in the distal alveolar space. And what we've seen is that this is partially uh, related to the enhanced abundance and perhaps activation of these uh, mesenchymal cells, uh, and it is also uh, related to the abundance of macrophages. And so we're really uh, delving into this uh, more to understand this cellular crosstalk. And in data I don't have time to show you today, we've learned that these um, injured macrophages have increased levels of SPP1, also known as osteopontin, and that this may be part of the mechanism by which macrophages stimulate alveolar type 2 cell proliferation. Now, we're really interested in this overall, because what I've shown you is that when you injure only your airway cells, that distal alveolar epithelial cells can respond to that. But why might this matter? Well, you can imagine that over multiple times of having a cold or other viral infections, if this is occurring, then your distal lung alveolar cells are undergoing these rounds of proliferation. It could perhaps exhaust them over time. And this might also make alveolar cells more susceptible to other diseases and especially to cancer. So these are concepts that we're really interested in understanding. And even more intriguingly, as we delve into the literature now, uh, we've also found evidence in the literature uh, that this uh, potential factor, SPP1, has also been demonstrated to be more highly expressed in COPD patients, and especially in those that have increased risk of lung cancer, and also uh, in other um, recent studies including this Nature Medicine study, uh, the abundance of these SPP1 positive macrophages has been associated in conditions in which there are severe responses to COVID, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and lung cancer. So we're um, really interested in making connections between what we found in this injury model and the organoid system to these states and these disease states. Now, of course, many of you in the audience might know, and we've already heard today, about how m these disease states are associated with aging as a major risk factor. And in fact, we've gone back and done these naphthalene airway injury studies with aged mice, and we do not see this proliferative response. So we know that there is a difference with age uh, in this story that I've told you. But what we also want to do is go forward from this work and better understand how are um, the risk factors for these diseases associated with the defects and the types of interactions with epithelial stem cells that I've told you about. Uh, as you know, I mentioned that age is a risk factor for cancer and these various diseases. And that makes us even more want to understand the basics of how the usage of these various cell types is altered with age. And so many years ago now, uh, 
Patricia Piscina and Carolina Garcia de Albas uh, went back to begin to ask the very basic question of what is different about aged lung stem cells. Uh, and there have been several publications of this, but not in great detail in characterizing the function of especially at progenitor cell populations. And so what they found first through immunofluorescence and comparing young versus old uh, mice and examining their lungs was there was a reduction in the abundance of those alveolar type 2 cells in the old mice. However, when they quantified the presence of the BAS population, which is that multipotent progenitor, there were um, an increased abundance of these cell types. But importantly, this is associated with functional changes. So the AT2 cells from old mice are less able to form organoids, and when you take the multipotent stem cell from old mice, they are less able to form alveolar cells, and they are actually better at making bronchiolar cells, which we thought was a really intriguing change. So we've begun to start to uncover what are the mechanisms behind these differences in age. And one of the first things we thought about looking at were the hallmarks of aging that many of us are familiar with. And of course, part of that includes epigenetic modifications. Now, one of our favorite epigenetic modifications, especially that of a former postdoc, Sam Robathon, was uh, lysine-9 methylation. And Sam had actually previously shown in this paper that um, methylation, that this methylation mark uh, regulates lung cancer progenitor cell activity. And he was able to make use of a number of tools in that study uh, where he could use an inhibitor of the enzyme called G9A, which is responsible for placing this methylation mark. Now, uh, lysine-9 methylation is known to have a repressive activity uh, and to uh, limit the expression of particular genes and to regulate the chromatin. And so this, because we already had tools available to ask about this methylation mark, Sam and Carolina and Patricia went back to their aging tissue, and then we involved a new grad student in the lab, Jake Jensen, to begin to ask if there were differences in this mark with age. And indeed, what Jake and Sam found when we compared young versus old mouse lung tissue, that particularly within this this AT2 progenitor cell population, there was a decrease in the abundance of this methylation mark. And we thought that it was intriguing that in comparison, the club or bronchiolar cells uh, also have a trend for the decrease, but not as significant. So we then asked, using functional assays, going back to the organoid cultures, whether or not this, the enzyme G9A, when it's inhibited in order to deplete this methylation mark, might alter the activity of these organoids. And indeed, when we took normal mice and we uh, prepared the alveolar cells for this type of organoid culture and added the G9A inhibitor, the cells are less able to make alveolar organoids. In fact, mimicking the phenotype of the aged mouse lung cells. Now, when Sam went on to use the G9A inhibitor and treated mice in vivo in order to ask how this might alter the ability of the progenitor cells to respond to lung injury. Uh, for this experiment, he used bleomycin, which we use in order to injure the alveolar epithelial cells. And very much like the naphthalene, uh, this is an injury that a normal mouse can repair, so that if you treat mice with bleomycin and look 28 days later, they look essentially normal compared to a PBS-treated mouse. However, when we treat mice with the G9A inhibitor, you can appreciate here in this H&E section that there's uh, increased abundance of damage in the mice that were uh, treated with the inhibitor. Now, it's also known uh, in other work that's been published that aged mice also have a very similar phenotype, that they have increased damage after bleomycin injury. And in fact, they are reported to have more fibrosis, uh, which is... Uh, is one way of modeling some of the aspects similar to the disease of pulmonary fibrosis. Now, uh, we examined whether or not these G9A inhibited and bleomycin-treated lungs have more fibrosis. However, the type of damage I'm pointing to you here is not fibrosis. What was really interesting to us is that when we stain for CCSP, which is a marker of the club cells, the bronchiolar cells I told you about earlier, 
that those damaged areas in the G9A treated mice are positive for this bronchiolar cell marker. So in other words, we have an aberrant abundance of bronchiolar cells in the alveolar space. This was really intriguing to us because patients with pulmonary fibrosis and some other conditions have this phenomenon of observation of bronchoalveolarization, uh, and we typically don't see that in mice. So we think that by interrupting this pathway that we might have a better way to model some of the aspects of those diseases. Now finally, we are beginning to look at how this might be controlled at the mechanistic level. And you might remember that I told you earlier that G9A limits uh, chromatin accessibility and gene expression. And we went back to the progenitor cells uh, and the mice treated with G9A inhibitor and performed ATAC-seq. And here I'm just showing you the traces from two genes, which are secretoglobulins, which are highly expressed typically only in uh, club cells. And we saw that with the G9A inhibitor, there was increased accessibility of these uh, bronchiolar cell genes. So in summary, for what I've shown you from this part of the talk, when we consider on the upper left a healthy or young uh, mouse lung, we know we have our typical abundance of our AT2 cells, our other progenitor cells, and typically in a normal mouse, these cells are quiescent until we perform an injury study. And then we can see that these cells can proliferate and act as the progenitor function. Now, in a mouse in which we've uh, reduced the methylation mark by interrupting this uh, G9A enzyme, or in old mice, we know that there are fewer alveolar type 2 cells, and those that are present are less able to proliferate and respond to repair alveolar cell injury. And what seems to happen is that the uh, an alternative uh, population of cells, the multipotent progenitors, are now enhanced in their activity and uh, engage in this aberrant repair. And we think one of the ways that this is controlled is by uh, increasing the likelihood that, this, uh, that airway cell type genes are activated in that progenitor cell population. So we're really interested to uh, bring this study together eventually with uh, the, the models that we have of lung cancer and to understand how these types of conditions might make, for example, AT2 cells even more susceptible to respond to an oncogenic mutation and to learn about what's really happening in an aged lung um, as it considers uh, oncogenesis. And finally, in just the last few minutes, I just want to make a plug for some of the new uh, technology that we are developing in the lab, because we really want to take these studies to be able to more directly ask about the parallels with human disease using patient samples. Now, uh, for years, uh, many people in the field have developed methods to take uh, human lung tissue and to uh, derive organoid cultures, either airway or alveolar cultures. Um, and uh, in this paper, Sachs et al., um, which is from one of our speakers for tomorrow, Hans Cleaver's lab, uh, they described how to use uh, a feeder-free uh, defined media that can grow out lung organoids. Uh, however, and in this paper, they largely used tissue samples, but they had one or two samples that were from the bronchoalveolar lavage of patients. And what we've done over the last year uh, with the really wonderful work of Monica Liu, a fellow in the lab, is that she's refined a protocol to be able to directly take um, patient BAL fluid and derive these uh, beautiful airway organoids. Uh, and you can see the nice formation of these organoids, uh, as well as some of them will have beating cells that are beating with cilia. Uh, and these organoids are largely composed of basal cells, but upon sequencing, we can see that they contain the diversity of cell types in the airway lineages. And what we're really excited is that we can take these lavage samples and derive these organoids uh, within about two weeks uh, from an individual patient. So these are primary cells that we can grow in passage uh, within the dish. And we're really excited to now uh, collaborate with any of you that might have samples like this and 
that we want to learn about different lung diseases this way. So in closing, uh, I hopefully I've shown you about how we're addressing some of the important questions in pulmonary cell biology. I've shown you the important cell-cell interactions uh, between epithelial cells, mesenchyme, and immune cells are regulating the usage of different progenitor cell types. And I've shown you how epigenetic regulation is key in controlling progenitor cell activity with age. And with that, I have tried to thank the people uh, who have done the work throughout the talk, and I'm highlighting the names here of the people uh, in the lab over the past years and the current years. Uh, and just, um, I'm very thrilled to have this wonderful team. And thank you, and I'll be happy to take your questions. So I'll start us off then really quickly. So. What do you think is the is the driver of epigenetic change during aging, and and is that you know you, you've shown us how it affects the function of these progenitors, and how much do you think that's being driven from above in terms of changes in fate determination um, versus function? Sure. So the question is really what leads to these epigenetic changes with age, uh, and for that we're still. That is a very important and big question that we need to understand. Uh, we have seen that the expression of this particular methyltransferase, G9A, is reduced in uh, only in AT2 progenitors with age, at least based on publicly available data. So there does seem to be a very precise specificity, at least within these different lung epithelial cells, of which cell types have the susceptibility to that epigenetic regulation. And one thing that we're, you know, we're really interested in what would be upstream of that. The other part that we really want to, that we are also delving into, is mechanistically uh, how other cell types are influencing the activity of those cells. And we think part of that are, again, cell-cell interactions. Fantastic talk, as always. So along that line, you had SPP1 changes, so you have osteopontin changes. What about its ligand, CD44? Did you see any changes there? Yeah, thank you. I just emailed Irene this morning to say, what did you see in CD44 in the Napoline time course? So we're, she's looking that up right now. Um, we do know that the alveolar type 2 cells express CD44, and in fact, there is a publication uh, uh, showing that maybe a subset of progenitors of AT2 uh, highly expressed CD44. And I had one more question, just about the, the macrophages you see infiltrating. Remember Emmanuel Passaget had a paper showing that there are stem cells that go to the lung and they're resident. Do they just get um, matured faster? What's going on there? Yeah, so we think that the changes we're seeing are the tissue resident macrophages, but we, we, so we don't think it's from the circulation necessarily. However, uh, we're also collaborating with people that look at the response to flu, and there may be a similar thing going on, where in that case, you know, we need to really separate how much of this is from the circulation and then becoming a tissue resident macrophage or not. So to be determined for that. Uh, I had a question right here in the second row. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the interesting thing, I, I, I noticed that the osteopontin, which is a ligand for various integrins, uh, one, one that we happen to be looking at is the alpha beta 3 integrin, mm -hmm. and we also see it in, in the model, the naphthalene model, uh, that integrin goes up very high. Mm -hmm. If you knock out the beta 3 gene, the CD61, uh, those uh, cells don't form. That, in other words, the, the club cell. Uh, does not regenerate. And I'm wondering, Wonderful. did you look at any uh, stem markers or any other uh, receptors for, uh, link to Kat's question, any other receptors for right. osteopontin that might be relevant? Yeah, so it turns out, and completing the answer to her, so the, the other integrins that are also potential receptors for the osteopontin, they are all expressed in the AT2 cells. And now we're going back to look does it actually change with that injury? So is it enhanced? The other really interesting thing is that uh, people have also shown that uh, macrophages uh, can promote lung cancer, especially in these uh, mouse models. And so we, we've also seen that CD44 is increased in expression in our very early stages of lung cancer. So we're trying to bring this all together, and I think you know, now we, we know what pathway we can chip away at. All right, thank you.